after 32 years of, of that iconic show that you did, is it liberating to be able to come out and go, OK, here's what I really think? Well, it is, except that it makes the assumption that one was totally muzzled. Yeah, but and... you never struck me as being muzzled. Well, I... muzzled, no. You've got... Look, you've got rules. You have to be straight. Mm. And that is to say you mustn't... I couldn't do and could never have done, while I was working for the BBC, what you do. Mm. Uh, is that a compliment? I mean, I, it, 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 it's <laughs> I, to, to be honest, John, to be honest, John, I'm not sure that Piers should do <laughs> or could do everything that a, he does. A bit early in this conversation to go there. Can you qualify perhaps, what you but, mean by the I, I, I will qualify one. I listen to you and, to be honest, not often, mm. because I was listening to my own programme. Of course, or yeah. doing on air, programmes yeah. are quite difficult. Um, and I think, my... God, how did you get away with that? Mm. I'll give you an and example. When we're talking about Brexit, Piers will openly say uh, that he voted Remain yeah, and example. would do again. Yeah, yeah. Now, he's constantly trying to imply the way that I vote. My feeling is that the audience should never know which way you vote. So if I asked you how you vote now, what would you say? I would say that I would not tell you how I vote right. or whether I vote. And I think it's really important that the viewers don't know which way you let me vote. Tell you. Because I think... Let me let you into a secret. No. They all know how you vote. No. <laughs> right. Actually, and, that's and... not true. And I, and I think if you get complaints from people saying that you're a Ramona or an ardent Brexiteer, then you know that you're doing the right job impartially when it comes to political issues. I think where we're freer now is to be able to... Over here on the ITV is to yeah, express it... an opinion about other things. And, of course, over at the BBC... There's been a whole muddle over whether Nan Naga Manchetti, mm -hmm. our colleague at BBC Breakfast, was mm -hmm. allowed to express an opinion about the use of a racist phrase by President Trump. And I think muddle is exactly the right word. Uh, there, there is a difference. There is, in my view anyway, and there still is, even though I'm free, because I'm free, mm. there is a difference between a presenter and a reporter, stroke analyst, stroke expert, stroke politician, whom you have called in to seek their opinions. The audience, I think, wants to hear their opinions. Now, you, I mean, you're a controversialist. That's what yeah. you do. Yeah. And people want, I think, this isn't butting up, mm. God forbid, I've never done that <laughs> before. But, but, but the fact is, they want to say, what's that bloody idiot going to say now? Or they want to say, what is what that... What is that genius? What I is think that, that phrase wisdom? Now, now, what yeah. tablets of stone? Yeah, I, I'm unashamedly a controversialist. In the sense that I like to express my opinions, uh -huh. many of which can be controversial. I, I have to say you wouldn't last five minutes in the BBC. No, I wouldn't. And, and rightly so. Yeah, I, mean, I totally agree. The BBC and I were not... I used to work there and I found it very uncomfortable. I didn't like being shackled in that way. And, it's you know, I, I admire those who can do it for a very long period of time. What I loved about your style, just to blow some smoke back at you... You're rather, welcome. ..rather more affectionate smoke than came this way... Um, <laughs> no, no, no. It was... A, <laughs> honestly, I'm, I'm, I know, I'm I know. entirely serious about this. I love listening. I mean, I don't listen to it very much, mm. but now that I have listened to it, I, I, it's entertaining apart from anything else. Thank it's you, fun. Mr Humphrey. It is fun. In fact, we, we try and have fun. And yeah. we try and provoke debate, and that's really... And, and we that's... see that as... We see that, actually, on this show as being... Our, our different, unique selling point to the BBC... Absolutely. ..which offers, you know... And we need variety in broadcast. Yeah. yeah. On the, on the Nagam and thing, it's quite interesting that a form, some former BBC bosses, Michael Grade and others, have come out and said, actually, the BBC was right the first time that actually no presenter should be inferring any motivation. That is the something. key to well, it. What did you make that, of that? Debate? Exactly that. That is exactly right, inferring motivation. She was invited to offer a few thoughts. Mm. And I suppose if we were all utterly Simon Pure and we, we were above reproach in every respect and she was wearing a little halo, she said, no, I don't think that I can entertain that, that thought because this isn't for presenters to do. Yes. But, you know, come on. And that would have been human. terribly dull it, it would, Well, A, it would have been dull. And, and not dull. enlightening but at it, all. But it would have been slightly silly. I don't think she did anything terribly wrong. That's nope. the truth of it. On the other hand, maybe oh, well, some of the bosses are right when they said this is awfully a bit here and a bit there, and I apologise for being boring about it, but maybe the bosses... Some of the bosses were right when they said she... Not she, they... They stepped over the line a wee bit. But, you know, sometimes lines are going to be stepped over. Sometimes you must feel, when you've done an interview where you've really skewered somebody for the right reasons, in other words, you've exposed a reality about the, the nonsense of their position, that is a satisfying moment, isn't it? You must feel... Oh, you can't deny that, of course, but I... <laughs> you can take the bloke out of the BBC, you can't take the BBC <laughs> out of the bloke, necessarily. Um, I'd like to think that I've exposed the failing in the argument. I mean, that's the mm. pompous way of yes. putting it, but, but another, I'm not in... Well, uh, 
are occasionally exceptions to this, I imagine. But um, I, I'm not trying to make the person, the politician, look an idiot or a villain. Most of the time, there are exceptions. Um, mostly, I'm trying to, like you are in the end, in spite of your occasional... Am I allowed to use the word bluster without offending you? You are, yes. I, 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 I like a bit of bluster. To be there. honest, um, you've called him a bloody idiot, John, <laughs> well, so I don't think you can say um, much worse. <laughs> What's interesting, you're talking about this in the present tense. Yes, I know. I noticed that all the time. Which is quite interesting. Yeah. I know. I mean, have you mentally... Are you no, mentally still no, there? Or? No, no, of course I'm still there. I'm, oh. 33 years, yeah. nearly. And, and how can you just... You already uh, miss it? You're it... here this morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You would yeah, never be yeah, here yeah, normally. Yeah, Do you yeah, want yeah. to know what they're doing right now? Shall we Shall we have a little listen oh, to... Uh... Go on. Hang on. What time is it? Tell me what time uh, it is. It's 7.45. What would they be doing at 7.45? Well, they will... They won't quite be into thought for the day, will they? This is one of the... You're not quite certain what they're going to be at this point, because at 7.30 they will do the hard interview, mm. usually, and then you'll have a slightly softer, maybe a take on the hard... And then another hard interview, and then in between comes mm. that rather pointless thought for the day. <laughs> Ooh. Who is the most impressive...? That's, that's, sorry, sorry, sorry. Mm. You don't think Thought for the Day should be on the Today programme anymore? I think it, if we are going to have Thought for the Day, and I've no problem with the Thought for the Day, sort it's of It's a moment edit, of reflection a sort of, by a, sort well, of a it, religious voice. Well, except... Yeah, but, but, ah, but you put your finger on it. it. It isn't religious Thought for the Day. It's not sold to us as religious Thought for the Day. But if you, or oh, God forbid, Piers... <laughs> Has and I use the word God forbid advice. Thank you. Um, yeah, I like if, that title. If, if Piers wanted to do a thought for the day, I don't know what his religion is, but I'm just guessing here, and, and this is a mm. guess, that you're probably agnostic or even atheist. Catholic. Catholic. Mm. You're a believing Catholic. I am. You're a practising Catholic. I'm, a, I'm not massively yes, practising, but there I'm, yet. A, I am, I'm a Catholic. I'm really a Catholic. <laughs> I was actually given spiritual. Right. I was given spiritual guidance for several years as a young man by nuns. Catholic well, it shows, doesn't it? Yes. Well, so therefore, <laughs> so therefore, here we have here we have a situation where peers would be allowed to do thought for the day. Yes. Because he can approach it from a Christian perspective mm. and say, as a Christian, I believe X, Y, and Z. I could not do it because. I do not How interesting. believe in any... And so for that reason, it's anachronistic, really, to you, right? Totally. And should mm. go. Mm. I'd like I, 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 I would go further. I would say it's discriminatory. You were the subject of so much speculation, most of it that you were part of this BBC Remainer bias. In the book, you, you come out on your Brexit colours and reveal how you voted. Uh, yeah, I voted Remain. <laughs> Who's the most impressive person you ever interviewed? For whatever reason... It was um, back in the 90s when, in South Africa, Mandela, the, the first Mandela election, the first democratic election was held. And I went out because I'd lived in South Africa, worked in South Africa, and I wanted, obviously, with a hugely important story, the, the first one. And, uh, and the day before the election, um, the, the voting itself, uh, they allowed certain people to vote early, people who were very, very old, disabled, pregnant women, whatever. And nobody's quite sure how many would turn out. And I went out to Soweto the, that, that morning to see, and it was deeply moving. There were massive, mm. massive lines of people, hugely disabled, very old people, pregnant women, and so on. Um, and so for the 810 slot, I wanted to talk, obviously, to people in one of these queues waiting to vote. And I wanted a bit of anger, you know, I wanted a bit of passion. Apartheid all those years, 50 odd years of apartheid, and these people had been denied the right to vote. So I wanted a bit of passion and a bit of anger. And I looked, I saw an old lady and, and, and a, a very pregnant young woman standing beside, and I thought, the old lady looks a bit feisty, and I had a quick chat with her, and she sounded exactly right. 810 came along, and I said, here I am, in the thing. And, um, and I said to the woman, Expect a bit. Um, in a few minutes, you're going to vote in, in, for, for the first time in your life in democratic elections. What's it mean to you? And she said, hmm, funny, not very much. And I thought, oh, God, oh, there's millions of people listening and it is going to be boring. Uh, and I waited. And then she said, and then she leaned across and patted the pregnant, the, the, the swollen stomach of the woman next to her. She said, but for the young man in this lady's stomach, it will mean everything. Mm. because he will be granted the dignity that has been denied to me throughout my life. Wow. And it was just one of mm. those mm. moments of magic. Uh, Amazing. It, it, uh, yeah, the, the hair on the back of my head still, you know... So. Yeah. Did you ever interview uh, Mandela? Uh, yes, I did. Yeah. Yes, I did. I, I, mean, uh, I had one time with him. I thought he was an extraordinary Absolutely man. extraordinary. I, mean, I was in the, the, the studio people. one day when uh, he was... Not, not in my studio, I was on the, on, on the record at the time. And um, there was a... A band, a black African um, band in the studio doing film. And Mandela 
appeared on the programme. Did you remember this? And, and, he, and he walked dancing. on. And the man, no, well, what happened was the, the chap who was leading the band uh, saw Mandela walking into the studio and, and he walked up there and he knelt <gasps> down. And Mandela was. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a pose, it wasn't, he wasn't Aww. just acting it out. It was Jenny, he was shocked and he, 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 he lifted up and he said, you must not kneel no. before me, I am just... Again, humility. Yes. You know, it's humility. funny, the other day I was, um, I was at a charity golf day, she was Francois Pina, who was the yeah. South African captain in yeah. the 95 Rugby World Cup. And he was telling me about the, the moment Mandela walked into the South African dressing room before the kickoff against the mighty All Blacks. And... Invictus had been this great poem that Mandela had given mm. Pinar to inspire the team. And he said Mandela came in and everyone just was so emotional yeah. and seeing him. But he said the key thing Mandela was, he got the black people of South Africa to support the predominantly white team. Yes, it was team. an extraordinary... And big, rugby absolutely. was a white person sport mm. in South Africa. Yeah, yeah, and he said yeah. Mandela got the black people to support us. And he said to this day, 25 years later, Pinar says, everywhere he goes, black South Africans call him their captain. Yeah. And he said it's the yeah. proudest thing of his life. Yeah. But that was Mandela's genius, in a way, was what? to bring what? people together. God, we could do what it What a now great man. We could Brexit, talk about him for the next... <laughs> Whoa! Just, uh, the book... Oh, the book! The, the book, book is I knew A there Day was a Like Today.